It, the state. To return to Freud's thesis, no law, no crime, only guilt. This guilt is primeval and it haunts man, whose nature both demands and denies three, quote, instinctual wishes of incest, of cannibalism and of murder, end quote. The reaction of most people to this concept is one of disgust, but the matter becomes more understandable if we recognise that the incest is directed against the mother and sisters, the murder and cannibalism against the father, and all three involve, in Freud's mind, a kind of murder of God and a violation of his law. This his nature both demands and savagely condemns, and this tension tears man apart. Socialism is thus a specious answer, however much Freud wanted it to be true. Quote, At first we were tempted to seek the essence of culture in the existing material resources and in the arrangements for their distribution. But with the discovery that every culture is based on compulsory labour and instinctual renunciation, and that it therefore inevitably invokes opposition from those affected by these demands, it became clear that the resources themselves, the means of acquiring them, and the arrangements for their distribution could not be its essential or unique characteristic, for they are threatened by the rebelliousness and destructive passions of the members of the culture. Thus, in addition to the resources, there are the means of defending culture, the coercive measures and others that are intended to reconcile men to it and to recompense them for their sacrifices. And these last may be described as the physical sphere of culture, end quote. But he did favour some kind of elitism, such as the dictatorship of the proletariat represented for, quote, government of the masses by a minority, end quote, is, quote, impossible to do without, for the masses are lazy and unintelligent, end quote. On the other hand, quote, culture has little to fear from the educated or from the brain workers, end quote. These men are secular and enlightened. The masses, on discovering the atheism of the leaders, would follow their scientific results and atheism, quote, without having affected in themselves the process of change which scientific thought induces in men, end quote. Having no fear of God and incapable of scientific enlightenment, they, quote, will certainly kill without hesitation, and so follows the necessity for either the most rigorous suppression of these dangerous masses and the most careful exclusion of all opportunities for mental awakening, or a fundamental revision of the relation between culture and religion, end quote. What hope is there, then, for a religion-free future of any value to man? What will man be without the narcotic of religion? The problems will be real, and Freud admitted, quote, the possibility that I too am chasing after an illusion, end quote, but man should still hope and experiment with, quote, a non-religious education, end quote, meaning a value-free one as well. The childishness must be outgrown and overcome, for, quote, man cannot remain a child forever, he must venture at last into the hostile world. This may be called, quote, education to reality, end quote. Need I tell you that it is the sole aim of my book to draw attention to the necessity for this advance, end quote. But the implied aim was that a totalitarian state was needed to ensure this growth without anarchy, quote, If you wish to expel religion from our European civilization, you can only do it through another system of doctrines, and from the outset this would take over all the psychological characteristics of religion, the same sanctity, rigidity and intolerance, the same prohibition of thought and self-defense. Something of this sort you must have in justice to the requirements of education. End quote. This passage, bypassed by most discussions of Freud, is a plain call for a psychoanalytic Grand Inquisitor who will institute, in the name of justice to the requirements of education, a totalitarian state which would even resort to the, quote, prohibition of thought in self-defence, end quote, the thought in question being clearly biblical faith. All this in the name of a hope which Freud admits may be illusory and is certainly remote. What avenue of hope was there to be explored? Religions are all mass delusions. Sustained happiness is unbearable to man, who finds, quote, it is much less difficult to be unhappy, end quote, for, quote, we are so constituted that we can only intensely enjoy contrasts, much less intensely states in themselves, end quote.
Moreover, quote, the liberty of the individual is not a benefit of culture, end quote, which rests on repression. Quote, human civilization rests upon two pillars, of which one is the control of natural forces and the other the restriction of our instincts. The ruler's throne rests upon fettered slaves, end quote. The sexual instincts in particular are strong, savage and antisocial, but quote-unquote civilized sexual morality is injurious and produces a nervous, sickly person. Hence, the urgency of sexual reform. Yet, people cannot be urged to sexual measures against which they have inner repressions, and sublimation of instinct is necessary to cultural evolution. It is productive to science. There has to be an economy of deprivation so that serious disorders may be avoided, but deprivation there must be to a degree. Where then is there any hope? Eros offers hope, for it, quote, aims at binding together single human individuals, then families, then tribes, races, nations into one great unity, that of humanity, end quote. Eros, thus, is an avenue of hope, quote, these masses of men must be bound to one another libidinally. Necessity alone, the advantage of common work, would not hold them together. End quote. In this line of thinking, Freud was a father of the Brock Chisholm type of belief that one worldism is the culmination of eros and of true mental health, with opposition to one being mental sickness. But with Freud's relativism, how can he say eros is more important than death? the will to love more basic than the will to death. His position is a form of ancient dualism, but one without a criterion of discrimination between light and darkness. Quote, the natural instinct of aggressiveness in man, the hostility of each one against all and of all against each one, opposes this program of civilization. This instinct of aggression is the derivative and main representative of the death instinct we have found alongside of Eros, sharing his rule over the earth. And now, it seems to me, the meaning of evolution of culture is no longer a riddle to us. It must present to us the struggle between eros and death, between the instincts of life and the instincts of destruction, as it works itself out in the human species. This struggle is what all life essentially consists of, and so the evolution of civilization may be simply described as the struggle of the human species for existence, and it is this battle of the titans that our nurses and governesses try to compose with their lullaby song of heaven. End quote. These are quote, two heavenly forces end quote, of equal power, death, and quote, equally immortal adversary, end quote, quote, eternal eros. End quote. Freud thus declines the attractive role of a prophet of glad tidings. Quote, I bow to their reproach that I have no consolation to offer them. For at bottom, this is what they all demand, the frenzied revolutionary as passionately as the most pious believer. End quote. Freud's hopes might be on the side of Eros, socialism and one-worldism, but he could only renounce such hopes as illusory. Thus, he expressed his respect for Romain Rollin in a letter to him of March the 4th, 1923, as one whose, quote, name has been associated with the most precious of beautiful illusions, that of love extended to all mankind, end quote. Being himself a Jew, Freud said, he was not readily given to believing in illusions. Moreover, quote, a great part of my life's work, end quote, he continued, has been spent in destroying personal illusions, quote, and those of mankind, end quote. Freud's writings could not be what Roland's were, quote, comfort and refreshment for the reader, end quote. And yet Freud had a good word for Roland's, quote, beautiful illusion, end quote. quote. But if this one hope cannot be at least partly realised, if in the course of revolution we don't learn to divert our instincts from destroying our own kind, if we continue to hate one another for minor differences and kill each other for petty gain, if we go on exploiting the great progress made in the control of natural resources for our mutual destruction, what kind of future lies in store for us? It is surely hard enough to ensure the perpetuation of our species in the conflict between our instinctual nature and the demands made upon us by civilization. End quote. Freud again expressed both his pessimism and hope in quote, 
Why War? End quote, 1932, an exchange of letters with Albert Einstein, 1879 to 1955, for publication. In answering Einstein on, quote, right and might, end quote, Freud pointed out, quote, that right is the might of the community. It is still violence, ready to be directed against any individual who resists it. It works by the same methods and follows the same purposes, end quote. Is there no difference then? One difference, Freud held, quote, what prevails is no longer the violence of an individual, but that of a community, end quote. This transition is psychologically affected when, quote, the union of the majority, end quote, is, quote, a stable and lasting one, end quote, thereby assuring the identification of might, right, or law. This community of the majority must be permanent, well organised, capable of anticipating and suppressing rebellion and executing, quote, legal acts of violence, end quote. It is violence within a community that produces peace. Moreover, wars between nations are, quote, a far from inappropriate means of establishing the eagerly desired reign of everlasting peace, since it is in a position to create the larger units within which a powerful central government makes further wars impossible, end quote. The weakness of this method is a lack of cohesiveness between the constituent parts. The answer in some kind of world order stronger than the League of Nations, quote, wars will only be prevented with certainty if mankind unites in setting up a central authority to which the right of giving judgment upon all conflicts of interest shall be handed over. There are clearly two separate requirements involved in this. The creation of a supreme authority and its endowment with the necessary power, end quote, Nationalism is hostile to such an order, while communism is held by many to be congenial to it. In any case, force cannot be replaced by, quote, the force of ideas, end quote, for, quote, law was originally brute violence, and that even today it cannot do without the support of violence, end quote. For Freud, there was no higher law and no right to which power must be subservient. There are only human instincts, and these are of two kinds. Eros, or the sexual in its broadest sense, on the one hand, and, quote, the aggressive or destructive instinct, end quote, on the other. We have here polarity, but not a moral one. Quote, we must not be too hasty in introducing ethical judgments of good and evil. Neither of these instincts is any less essential than the other. The phenomena of life arise from the operation of both together, whether acting in concert or in opposition. End quote. Thus, Freud reduced his own preference for a one-world socialist order to a purely non-moral matter of personal taste. The death instinct and the life instinct are equally valid, if value can be used as a criterion. Quote, there is no use in trying to get rid of men's aggressive inclinations. End quote. Communists are guilty of illusion, if such is their hope. But how can Freud's own one-world hopes be achieved? Quote, Our mythological theory of instincts makes it easy for us to find a formula for indirect methods of combating war. End quote. Eros must be encouraged to stand more strongly against Thanatos. Two kinds of ties between men can be encouraged. First, a love of neighbour, and second, identification through a community of interests. This will correct imbalance. The encroachments of church and state, quote, upon freedom of thought, end quote, need to be removed, quote. The ideal condition of things would be, of course, a community of men who had subordinated their instinctual life to the dictatorship of reason, end quote. And for Freud, this, quote, dictatorship of reason, end quote, meant a total power like that of Plato's philosopher kings, enlightened rulers of absolute power. Quote, Nothing else could unite men so completely and so tenaciously, even if there were no emotional ties between them. But in all probability, that is a utopian expectation. End quote. This last sentence is typical of Freud. His hope is real, but his denial of that hope is equally real. He was ready to make a case for war and yet call himself a pacifist. Quote, for organic reasons, end quote, and hope that, quote, the rest of mankind become pacifists too, 
end quote. Thus he hoped, but even in hoping called his pacifism, quote, an idiosyncrasy, end quote. The one world order he hoped for was an order built on violence, and reason itself was no more than a biological aspect of man, a thin veneer over a vast unconscious. Freud had written at length on the nature of dreams as an infallible index to the unconscious forces in man. Could not the dream of reason, including Freud's own, be dismissed also as a significance only in terms of the unconscious in man rather than a valid ground for action? Freud could not say. The death instinct was for him equally valid, equally real with the will to live. Quote, it is not a question of an optimistic as opposed to a pessimistic theory of life. End quote. Quote, From the first origin of life, end quote, the two have been in operation for quote, life would consist in the manifestations of the conflict or interaction between the two classes of instincts. End quote. As Freud admitted, quote, we have unwittingly steered our course into the harbour of Schopenhauer's philosophy. For him, death is the true result and to that extent the purpose of life, while the sexual instinct is the embodiment of the will to live. End quote. But does not the id with its pleasure principle offer a way of escape? Would it not be logical to assume that the pleasure principle is on the side of Eros alone? Freud closes this last door. Quote, the pleasure principle seems actually to serve the death instincts. End quote. Indeed, there are grounds for assuming that Eros itself serves death for Freud, or is part of it. One Freudian has spoken of the quote, confusion end quote, in Freud quote, that made him formulate the Nirvana principle first as Eros, then as death. End quote. Man's nature, thus, is not only burdened with a sense of guilt, with no meaning or responsibility behind it, but man is also doomed to seek expiation of that guilt through masochistic activities, to inflict self-punishment upon himself by way of atonement, or by sadism, to lay his guilt upon an innocent one. Freud's preliminary studies in this area were carried to their fuller implications by Theodore Reich, Masochism in Modern Man, and by Edmund Burglar in a series of works, The Basic Neurosis, Homosexuality, Disease or Way of Life, and others. Freud had sought to dissolve guilt by science. He had only fastened it more firmly on man. Like karma, it remains. The religious concept he had warred against had atonement through Christ. His concept merely doomed man to endless self-punishment and made his will to live by implication a servant of the will to death. Quote, the sense of guilt, end quote, led to sadism and masochism. Freud himself did not see the implications of masochism as clearly as Reich and Burglar, but he went far enough to see man's hopeless plight, and having denied sin, he had also denied salvation. For in reducing guilt to biology, he had no way of enabling man to transcend his biology, and hence transcend or escape his biological sense of guilt. His biological myth and anthropological myth had become the new dimensions of man's hell, the cartoonist Marcel Wert caught the meaning of Freud's work in a cartoon in his series of satires on psychoanalysis. It's all mental, quote, You mean to tell me that if Van Gogh had been psychoanalyzed, he wouldn't have cut off his ear? End quote. Quote, of course he would, but he would have known why. End quote. Moreover, whatever man did, he was guilty, so that guilt was intensified by Freud. Thus, quote, when her prospective new employer asked why she had left her former job with a psychiatrist, a Los Angeles secretary replied, I couldn't win. If I was late for work, I was hostile. If I was early, I had an anxiety complex. And if I was on time, I was compulsive. End quote. Lest we be tempted to dismiss this as humorous overstatement, let us consider Burglar's comment. Quote, the best summary of my opinions on this topic that I know was presented by a patient, a famous humorist, who told me in analysis, quote, According to you, there are two items that are musts on the psychic menu, the masochistic stew to stew in and nibble on, and the pseudo-aggressive cocktail to counteract the effects of the stew. Misuse of reality serves the first, wit the second purpose, meant, quote, a witty if malicious explanation, but at least on the periphery of the facts as I see them. End quote. 
However much burglar's last sentence indicates unhappiness over this evaluation, his first sentence calls it, quote, the best summary, end quote, and rightly so, for Freud's pessimism closes the door of hope for man and leaves him only sickly musts. Freud analyzes. He does not cure. He seeks to give understanding, not to save. Over the doorway of strict Freudianism can be entered the words, quote, Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. End quote. There is no man without guilt feelings, which, because they are biological, are not expiable. Civilization for Freud is impossible without repression, but the more civilization grows, the more savagely the repressed forces lash out against it. The growth of civilization is thus, in this view, a guarantee of its destruction. Freud provided a tool for the total state and its control of man. Thus, the enlightened elite, although guilt-ridden, know that guilt is illusory and without meaning except as a biological fact. But the dangerous masses can be held in guilt more firmly than ever, while the elite seek to guide man's evolution.